Thank you. Will you mark? Senator Kissel. Thank you very much, Madam President. December 14, 2012, for our family was holiday time. It was a Friday. Many of us who have children drove them to school, kissed them goodbye. Uh, my friends and colleagues here in the circle are well aware that I have two sons that I'm extremely proud of, my son Nathaniel, who's 17, but my little guy Tristan, who just happens to be born on December 15th. So on that Friday, not only was our family looking forward to the Christmas holidays, but we were very much looking forward to that Saturday when we would celebrate Tristan's ninth birthday. And as I drove home that Friday and listened to all the accounts on the radio and was completely overwhelmed that what I saw at the beginning of the day, while physically it had not changed, emotionally it had changed because of the events that we were being told had unfolded in Newtown, there was a pall not only over Connecticut, but our entire nation and to those that were following the story from throughout the world. And when I got home, my little guy was there, and as all moms and dads did that night and probably have reassured themselves to do every day, so I gave Tristan in particular a hug and a kiss and I said, did you know what happened today? And he did. Not in any great detail, but they had explained it at a school. And we went over and we chatted a little bit. Was he afraid? And he actually wasn't. He actually confided that he was more disturbed by the fact of what took place in Colorado. Because as a little nine-year-old or eight-year-old going on nine, he was a huge Dark Knight Batman fan. And... It's almost as if he understood that there were, might be some rigors in a school environment, but a movie theater, that's where magic was supposed to happen. You're supposed to be safe and transported into a different world. Wow. So I would acknowledge that these events do have an impact on us as well as our children. And to the extent we make efforts to try to stop these events, those efforts are worthwhile. We had an enormously long public hearing on the 28th of January. I've had longer in judiciary when we would start at 10 and end at quarter to 3. We had panels in the morning and the public didn't begin testifying until 1. But again, it was one of those marathon hearings where we didn't end till about quarter to 3. And then on that Wednesday, everybody who was honored enough to serve on the general task force was invited to go to Newtown High School. And it was an unusually warm January 30th, but still overcast. And I arrived in Newtown, a town I had passed through probably dozens of times, but hadn't really spent an awful lot of time in the town. And our hearing was to begin at 6, and I got there an hour early, and I, and I just wanted to drive around and get a feel for the community. And I drove by the front of Sandy Hook Elementary School and saw probably four cones blocking the entrance and where that fire department is. And clearly, no one was going down that, that roadway. And I just wanted to drive around the neighborhood, and I saw houses with with tributes on there, front of their houses. And I just sort of followed the roads, and I followed a road up a hill. And lo and behold, to my right, I saw a beautiful park. And I just decided to go in there, and there was only one vehicle in there. It was a commercial trucker just finishing up his paperwork. And as I parked, he drove out, and now I'm in a park up on a hill, in Newtown, in the Sandy Hook section of town, just looking about, trying to get a feel for that community. 
I think the school is close to that part. I got a sense that that was the case. It was a beautiful park. It still is. I haven't been back to Newtown since that day, January 30th. But I remember walking. It was an area, pool area, soccer fields, picnic pavilion. And up near the edge of a hill, that little playscape area where you know little kindergartners and first graders and second graders would like to play. And I walked near that area, and in that park, it sort of falls down, and there's deep woods and paths, and it was too muddy to, to tree even travel down there. But I had a sense that near that park was that school. And I almost had a sense that perhaps some of the souls of those little children, administrators and teachers, I like to believe that one goes up to heaven but if they were going to come down as angels and visit, that would be familiar territory and friendly territory, a happy memory. What do those moms and dads feel? They testified before us on that Monday. They came to Newtown High School and testified again. I have told my constituents, I said, as a dad, if that happened to my children, I don't know what I would fight for or not fight for because to lose a child before yourself and to lose a child in that kind of situation has got to be every parent's worst nightmare. So I spent a good half hour in that park just trying to get a sense of where I was, wondering if maybe down that hill in those woods was that school but I wanted to be up where the playscape was trying to hope that there were still some of those good sentiments. And before I left, a young woman with an English accent, I don't know if she was the mom or the nanny, but two little kids on little bikes with little training wheels. And it was nice. They were just, I mean, when in January 30th did you get to go to a park and they got to go to a park? And I go, lucky day for these guys. And she goes, yes. And I go, what's the name of this park? And, and I thought she said Dreadwell, and that seems sort of... She goes, no, Treadwell. Maybe that was a Freudian slip. But that was the park. That was the place. I will always remember that place, because I think there's something special there. There's something special in that community, and they will struggle with this for the rest of their lives. But to the parents and the first responders and everybody that came and testified, I have got to give them huge respect. Now, very briefly, I want to bring you back 30-odd years to when I was a student, an undergrad student at the University of Connecticut. And it was a beautiful late September, early October day. It was a Saturday or Sunday. And I just decided to, I was a freshman, I wanted to explore the territory. I didn't, you know, you know where you are, you have your dorm, it was the Northwest Quadrangle. I wanted to take a walk, and it may have been North Eagleville Road, I'm not exactly sure. But I walked by myself, just enjoying the autumn leaves. And I stumbled upon what could only be a colonial graveyard, and I read some of the tombstones over on the right-hand side, and they were really incredible, and, and I actually wrote, wanted to write one down, use it for myself. And sort of being a little, I wouldn't necessarily adventurous, but I like to explore, I walked into this colonial graveyard that didn't really have a formal gate opening or anything. It was just tucked away in the woods. And I went to the back of it, and I was startled by what I saw. 18-year-old kid, new to a territory, a state of Connecticut, and over in the distance, I saw something that was so strange. It was like out of a movie. And it was a set of buildings, stark. And someone was in a caged area with someone standing not too far away, maybe holding a baton or holding the keys to the, to the caged area. And this person was like, just kept like, shaking spiders off themselves or something like that. It was, it was very odd. I couldn't actually, I mean, part of it is you watch that and then you skedaddle out of there as fast as you humanly can. Well, it turns out, lo and behold, I had stumbled into one of the back areas of Mansfield Training School. 
And back in those days, people with severe mental illness were housed in these institutions, and folks got it in their heads that, you know what, this is not a humane way to treat people with mental disabilities. And so we went about as a society in the last 30 years or so deinstitutionalizing individuals and those that are severely disabled we still make sure have appropriate housing and care. But for so many with mental disabilities there is not the appropriate medical attention, there is not the appropriate housing, there is not the appropriate care as a society whether they are new veterans returning back from war, whether they are the homeless, whether they are young people spotted in schools even at the earliest ages, we don't do a good job in that area. We did a good job letting folks out of the institutional climate, but we haven't really done the other part of it. And there are good things in this bill regarding mental health parity recommendations of the Program Review and Investigations Committee in fact, in the bill that we have before us, there's a lot of good things. But then I get to my other point, because we had the litany of experiences that people have pointed to and said, look at this horrific event and look at that horrific event. And I say, look at it in the totality of circumstances in our country. And while in many instances guns are involved, the thing that I see as the common thread is the mental health issue. And while the bill before us this afternoon touches that and creates a task force to study it further and is very ambitious and has laudable goals, to my mind, that's where we need to look first. And unfortunately, what I have seen over the years, whether one disagrees with me or agrees with me, is that we turn to guns first. It's like that movie Casablanca where the French police chief goes, bring in the usual suspects. Well, anybody involved in law enforcement knows you match the evidence to the suspect, you don't bring in the usual suspects. There are people that will be against certain guns no matter what. I do not state that any of my colleagues whom I care for in this circle feel that way. But there are folks out there that have no use for the Second Amendment whatsoever. And so the first thing they look to is how do we regulate guns even further? How do we regulate ammunition? How do we make it more difficult? And I say that's okay to discuss. It's worthwhile. We owe it to the parents and the loved ones and the sisters and the brothers and the husbands, the moms and the dads. We owe them that discussion. But at the end of the day, making it more onerous, more cumbersome, more burdensome on law-abiding citizens in our state is not the solution. Please don't. Please don't. Excuse me, Senator. You're, you're, Excuse you're, me, Senator. Excuse you are not me. helping my argument. Excuse me a minute, Senator. Ladies and gentlemen, I asked before... I ask you again, please hold your applause or your boos. Um, this is not the time. I have been told and asked by the, the state police, uh, the Capitol Police, to if you continue this, they are going to remove you. I ask you not to do that because we really do think you should be in this chamber. Thank you very much. Thank Senator. You. Thank you, Madam President. And it's not an easy decision. I can tell you right here and right now, I didn't sleep at all Monday night because I had the images of little kids in my face, in my dreams. The 20 little first, year, first graders. So I have my public policy views. I have what I believe in that I've stood for for over 20 years. But I will say this to everyone in the state of Connecticut. This is not an easy vote for any of us. If any one of us had the magic solution we would be done. Nothing could make me happier than if this bill solved all of these issues. But in my heart of hearts, I don't believe that to be the case. I respect those that brought this bill before us. 
I can state unequivocally that if it were not for Senator McKinney, Representative Caffaro, and others in that room negotiating this bill, it would be far more onerous on law-abiding gun owners, hunters, sportsmen, competitors, those that just want to collect firearms. But at the end of the day, I have to weigh all the good things, and there's lots of good things in here, versus those steps that I feel that go too far in maybe not necessarily demonizing law-abiding gun owners, but making their lives much more difficult. Some people have said, have you changed your position because you've got the bill here and you're going through it. This isn't the bill. This isn't the bill. This is five years old, District of Columbia versus Heller. This is the United States Supreme Court decision that finally was handed down that stated succinctly that that prefatory clause in the Second Amendment does not limit the substantive clause that people have a right to bear arms. And you don't have a right to bear arms in the United States because you need to join a militia. You have a right to bear arms because you can protect yourself. That has been the multi-centuries history of folks blazing away through the wilderness and protecting themselves through all sorts of hazards in the United States. I have heard there will be legal challenges to the bill before us this afternoon. I do not know if this will be grounds to overturn any of the portions in the bill before us. But I will say this, and I will conclude with these sentiments. Our founding fathers knew exactly what they were doing. And I stumbled upon something in the last couple of months purely by chance. Hard winter, cold, cold now. It's April, it's cold. It's listening to an audio book, going to and from work, to and for, from session, sometimes just taking half hour walks in my neighborhood just trying to get out of that house because it's winter and you get cabin fever. And the book I selected, a long one, was the biography of John Adams. I was fascinated. I'm a New Englander. He's a New Englander. I always thought he got a little short shrift being boxed in between Washington and Jefferson. And it was fascinating. My love and respect for that man, that president, went up astronomically with the rendition of his story of his life. One of the things I like the most is he doesn't view life as a ladder where you're trying to always get ahead. He viewed it as a journey where you need to try to learn something all along the way. But buried in there, as I'm listening six, seven, eight weeks ago, on March 14th, 1776, the Continental Congress, not the bad guys, the good guys, as they voted on all issues at that time, knowing that they were about to go to war with Britain in revolution, obviously behind closed doors because you don't want to be accused of defying your nation. On March 14, 1776, they voted to take away all the firearms of every colonial citizen that was leaning towards or supportive of the British, any Tory, approximately one-third of the colonists. They don't teach us that in school, but that's what they voted on. John Adams, Ben Franklin, our heroes. They knew war was on the horizon and they said, well, better get the guns away from these folks so that we don't have to watch behind our back as we're fighting the British in front of us. Well, doesn't that make sense? They knew how powerful a weapon that was, that later on, as the Constitution's being formed and they amend the Constitution, right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That makes sense. Because guess what? Most of those folks were the same, they were certainly informed about the same events, and they said to themselves, wow, 
we were able to go do that. Granted, it was the anticipation of war, but you know what? We got to make sure that never happens to us. So going forward, we're going to make sure that we have that right so that never can happen to us because that's a scary thing. Is it something legitimate that I'm concerned about happening a year from now or two years from now or three years from now? I don't know. I would not suspect it to be so. But for those individuals that are concerned about their Second Amendment rights, incrementalism is a real concern. And having all the information in one area is a real concern. Because while this year people are grandfathered, there clearly are individuals that would not go that far and would say, you know what? These magazines should be gone now. And you know what? We're not going to compensate you for them. And you know what? These hundred guns should be gone now. And you know what? We are not going to compensate you for them. And if you don't like us, like it, sue us. And then maybe the Supreme Court would decide it five or six or seven years down the line. Because my constituents in North Central Connecticut and many other places that I've heard from understand incrementalism. They understand big government. They have a slight suspicion. Oh, you only want to go this far today, but tomorrow you might go a little farther. And I can't blame them for that concern when I hear that we have this great compromise in the bill, the bill before you, but at the same time, both Governor Malloy and advocates for further gun control say it doesn't go far enough, but it's, it's a good first step. How can I turn to my constituents that are concerned about incrementalism and losing their Second Amendment rights, how can I turn to them and say they're not being reasonable, but at the very same time this bill is before us, folks that want further control are saying it's a, just a good first step. That's their proof. And while there may be an agreement between the leaders not to go further this year with further gun control efforts, it's my understanding there is no such agreement for next year or the year after or the year after that. So I will conclude by saying this. You just can't have a heart at all if you don't feel for the families and friends and neighbors of the victims of that Newtown massacre. You don't have to be a mom or a dad to know how diabolically evil it is for someone to go in there and shoot first graders. Everyone understands that we need to do something to address that. Mental health issues, school safety enhancements. But when it comes to further regulations on guns and ammunition, in one of the states that is touted as having, right now, some of the most tough gun laws in the United States of America, I think goes one step too far. And for that reason, Madam President, with the utmost respect to the proponents of the legislation, and with the utmost respect to the moms and the dads and the husbands and the wives and the brothers and the sisters, and all of the God-fearing, law-abiding citizens in the state of Connecticut, I will have to vote no this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Meyer.